So I'll just share here. Actually, I think I need to share first. This way. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, we're very much looking forward to this discussion today. We have a few um, hyperlinks here that we can put in the chat as well after. Um, these are some of the OERs that we've been engaged in to date um, at Ryerson University. Um, so here are our presenters today. Myself, I'm Una Seitan. I'm an associate professor at the School of Nursing in, at Ryerson University. Um, we have Sita Mistri here who is a, um, a student in the program at Ryerson University um, and also a sister midwife of ours um, who we, we um, really enjoy teaching and learning with. And then our fabulous librarian, Sally Wilson, who is um, our sort of go-to person for all questions related to copyright, but also the development of these open resources. She's been on a few of our teams to date. Uh, this is the rest of our larger big team. <laughs> so as you can see, there's a few of us. And the reason for that is because we are a, we're co-creating a PAR study. And I'll speak, to the, I mean, that's the whole idea of this presentation today is why PAR, what is PAR? And I'll speak more to that, but it really is this sort of large movement or organic team that's emerged and that continues to grow and emerge further. Um, so these are my colleagues. Um, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some findings from our inventory analysis to look at curricula within nursing at Ryerson and understand, um, you know, how much content is open, what's sort of been some of the history behind that, and um, what is our direction for moving forward. And that ties in nicely into our um, reason and our sort of um, rationale for building this PAR study. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the suitability of PAR as an appropriate methodology for building open education um, and then engage you all in an envisioning exercise um, to think about how we can extend this a little bit further in nursing. So uh, in nursing education, there's, there's been a growth, there's been this surgence of open educational resources, despite a relative lack of awareness among faculty. Um, there's a need for high quality and suitable OER that meet curriculum demands. We've done a few studies now to look at um, what are um, some faculty demands and what are some of the student um, responses to open education. Um, we've had very positive responses from the studies that we've uh, done and we're um, moving towards the need for, for more and more high quality education. I don't know if others experience this, but certainly when we, because we're in applied science, if we direct students to uh, find resources that support their learning in terms of hands-on application, they often go to YouTube <laughs> and that's their go-to place for finding information. Unfortunately, it's not vetted or curated the way we would like it to be. And so then they become reliant on developing skills that are really um, not based on the teaching and learning that we support. So out of that, we really sort of created these videos and e-textbooks and virtual games um, with the intent to sort of replace some of that information that they've gone to find. And then finally, despite all of this, uh, there's still a lack of time and resources. I'm sure that's um, a very common issue for people um, to engage and to do this. And we very similarly engage in the summer sprints at Ryerson in terms of creating these quick and, and um, quickly pulled together resources. Still high quality though, I must say, um, but it's, uh, it, does, it is usually over the summer months that we're engaging in this work. So at our particular school, we have a small group and I would almost say a contagious group of, of faculty who are very much engaged in the creation of OER. Uh, myself and a few other faculty so far have developed eight open educational resources in the past three years. Um, we've created e-textbooks um, looking at immunizations, health assessment techniques, how to do vital signs. Um, we've looked at communication and documentation. There's, we've developed several open educational resources and um, as much as we are very uh, contagious in the sense that we, we encourage and we support and mentor others to, to do this type of learning. It's not quite as far as long as we would like it to be. 
Um, so because of that, that's really been the impetus for this work today and understanding how do we get more people invo involved and build that capacity and how do we sort of move towards um, in a more inclusive approach for understanding um, open education. And so to do that, um, we have to understand some of the hesitancy, I think, um, towards open education. Um, so so um, there is uncertainty when we, when we attend faculty meetings around Creative Commons uh, licensing and what does that involve? And what happens, are there legal repercussions of, in terms of um, if there is reproduction or remixing of material, what does that look like? So that we've seen, we've identified as a need for further clarification. Um, there's been uh, some identified ambiguity related to rigor and the peer review process. Is it peer reviewed? Is it not? What, how is the rigor um, within the OER? And is it only for this institution? Can it be taken up in other places? So these are some of the other identified issues related to hesitancy. And then uptake, um, for the most part, is limited to the people who create it which is we're trying to move that as well. So it's not that we necessarily want all faculty to be creators of OER, but at the very least to consider their uptake in their courses. And at, in, at Ryerson University right now, uh, we are seeing that the uptake is very much limited to those who are creating the OER. Um, so it's usually designed for your specific course. There might be application to other courses, but we haven't had those sort of transitions yet into other courses. Um, so I'm going to let Sita now talk about the inventory analysis that we conducted. Go ahead, Sita. Thank you, Anna. So uh, while creating these open educational resources, at the beginning, um, we decided to do an inventory through an environmental scan. And the definition of the OER was something that we actually need to really land on together. So it was important that we identified what OERs we were including in this. And so were we including virtual gaming simulations um, or materials that were just included as open access. But what we ended up going with was there had to be some capacity for um, remix and edits in the future that could happen um, right away. Oh, there we go. Uh, so currently the OER usage uh, with the previous curriculum, so Ryerson has gone through uh, the nursing program changing over from um, our old curriculum to a new revised one. So in the previous, we had about a 3.88% of OER uptake. Um, and most of that, as you can see, that 17.39% was actually from first year. There wasn't really any OER uptake in second, third, or fourth. And uh, similar to what uh, Una had said, that's mainly because of the creators are the ones who are using it in their classes. And most of those are professors in first year. Uh, now with the revised curriculum uh, that is starting as of this year, 2020, we now have, again, uh, we're able to compare first year because that syllabus is available. And we now have a 32.2% of OER uptake, um, which we really see that some courses are adapting fully going towards OER because they're created for that course, um, or at least sharing the resources in other courses. Thanks, Sita. So you can see that there has been an, an uptake with this very sort of active group. Um, but so part of our issue was, well, how do we get others involved and what, 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 would, what will that look like? How do we actually build capacity towards the adoption of OER within our particular school? And so to address this, we've used PAR methodology. And participatory action research refers to problem solving through a cycle of planning, action, and reflection. Um, so the, the idea is to assess our own practices and come to um, realize or to discover what are some of the understandings that connect these practices. And those are the things like rigor, um, you know, licensing, what are some of our understandings around the adoption of OER? And then what are the conditions for practices? So even beyond that, what funding is available? How are they valued? Um, is there student momentum and student desire for um, open education? And, and can, is there, does that come to be expected within the um, curricula? It's actually quite strategic too that a lot of the OERs are in first year because it sets an expectation 
for subsequent years about what um, to create. So through this sort of um, action research and understanding the practices, understandings of practice and conditions for practice, um, were, have emerged these sort of projects that were, were, um, were developing or were initiating with community to understand how do we actually get people included and on board on this. So it encourages involvement of all stakeholders in the research process. This includes librarians, it includes community um, organizations like eCampus Ontario. It includes um, students uh, and faculty and um, essentially anyone who identifies as a user or stakeholder. It also includes nurses who have graduated the program as we really do promote lifelong learning within our school of nursing. Um, the idea of PAR is that it's emancipatory, cooperative, and there's mutual inquiry. So from the outset, you know, we've, we've developed this large team and through that team emerges the research question and then emerges the um, methods that we've been using as well as, um, you know, any publications or anything that emerges as part of this team and group. Uh, so, um, so why did we choose this methodology? It's very much suited for our applied profession of nursing. Um, it's, there's a desire for us to come together and to, and to build this momentum. Part of our hesitancy within the School of Nursing, uh, I think is, is situated within our history as nurses of really trying to legitimize our profession as a unique body of knowledge. It wasn't until the 90s that we really became a PhD program and, and started to have our own legitimate body of knowledge. And that is part of this sort of sensitivity, I think, to what is the rigor process? Are we spinning our wheels? And so really tackling and addressing that with faculty is an important part of um, building that capacity. There's iterative and critical questions within the community that we need to respond to. The licensing questions, the uptake questions, those are really important for us to address. And I think that the other option would be just to plow forward with OER, but we would be remiss in, in not really getting a feeling or an understanding for what our colleagues' hesitancies were related to PAR. Um, so it helps us push the boundaries of inclusion. Who, who are some of the peripheral people who would otherwise not consider this approach and how do we sort of begin to get them involved and, and participating in this work. And it results in action. The, the whole goal is to move um, open ed forward. And that is our intent and that is our, um, our, ult our ultimate goal. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sally now to engage us all in a um, exercise towards um, envisioning what it could be like and what are some of your own unique challenges related to um, open educational adoption within your schools. Okay, thanks, Una. So now we come to the audience participation portion of this presentation, and we were hoping to get your input on three questions that we have on a Google Doc. So I have put the link in the chat, and it's also on this slide. So if you'd like to go and access that Google document, and we'll have, well, we were hoping five minutes for this activity, maybe a few minutes, couple minutes less than that, but there are three questions that we're interested in getting your input on. So these are what barriers exist within your discipline related to open education? What information hesitancy is there within your community? And what strategies do you suggest for moving forward in open expansion? So once you get into the doc, um, just write down the first couple of things you, that come to mind for each question. And it's okay to repeat what others have said because repetition is good, it helps us see the trends, okay? So we'll give you a few minutes to do this and then I'll let you know when time's just about up and then we could move on to looking at what some of your comments were. Thanks.
going to stop share for a moment while we update. I'm seeing themes here. Is anyone else? <laughs> We're just going to pull some of those themes right now and we'll we'll take those up. I, I agree. I definitely seeing themes here. We have about three minutes remaining. Okay. Um, gonna, we do have a, let's see. So we've just got this. I'll just put one more in, Una, and then okay. we can. I'll just wait while, so people can see here. Okay, I've got two done, Una. So if you want to just sure. So we we just wanted to share some with some word clouds with you about where we were, what some of the hesitancy looks like, and what were some of the barriers. Uh, it definitely a theme that's emerged are the grants and funding. Um, there's there seems to be a lack of opportunity, but even I think through sourcing out why that is, you know, where, what what you know, how do we start to privilege this even in our funding calls and how do we start to, to build this momentum? And again, I mean, I, I think it really is important to have student voice um, in all of this because, uh, you know, it really does um, affect students. And if it comes to be an expectation that there are, that we do move towards open education, that might help us um, move forward as well. So thinking about collaboration, um, information, uh, I'm seeing um, the quality that's emerged as, as part of the barriers and some of the strategies to move forward are um, grants and um, uh, collaboration, larger sort of connections to the community and, and beyond. So just as a, a final note for our next steps, um, we are, we've got a research study, actually, um, I, we should connect with you, Monica, because um, very similarly, we've just started to look at student perceptions of equity, diversity, and inclusion within our nursing OER, and do they feel represented, represented? Do they feel included in what we have created to date, and what lessons can we learn for moving forward? Um, through our inventory analysis, we plan to write a position statement with our accreditation um, um, body to, to help us set some goals for nursing education. So if we are at, you know, 3% within our whole curricula at this point, how do we move towards, um, you know, 25% within five years or something, something reason along those lines to really help us move towards something, um, a target, and to continue with our faculty consultation. So we have um, just started a focus group with faculty to better understand how to move forward. So here's, if you have any questions, here's our email, um, our Twitter handles, and, 
and please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. If you would like to continue this conversation, please feel free to do so over at OEG Connect. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and your work in this field. Um, I already sent the link to some of these uh, resources to a colleague, a former colleague of mine, and she was very excited and very keen to learn more. So thank you all so much. Um,